Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Denise Jorgens, and I'm the Director of International House at the University of Chicago. On behalf of the International House's worldwide community and One Shared World, we are so pleased to host today's program, Next Generation Leaders Cultivating a Culture of Peace a conversation with four amazing young global leaders who undertook Davis Projects for Peace this past summer. Davis Projects for Peace is an initiative for students at Davis United World College Scholars Program, partner schools, as well as international houses worldwide to design their own grassroots projects anywhere in the world. Projects are meant to promote peace and address the root causes of conflict among parties. Students are encouraged to use their creativity to design projects and employ innovative techniques for engaging project participants in ways that focus on conflict resolution, reconciliation, as well as building understanding and breaking down barriers which cause conflict and finding solutions for resolving conflict and maintaining peace. Each year, member institutions of international houses worldwide select 20 projects for funding of up to $10,000 each. This is a special year for the international houses worldwide community as our first international house in New York City, which is represented uh, uh, by one of their students today, is celebrating their 100th anniversary. International House of Chicago was founded by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in 1932, and so our 100th anniversary is just a few years away. I think it is worth noting that international houses worldwide actually predate the founding of the United Nations. We invite you to join us throughout the academic year for many of our other Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series programs. And you can find information about our upcoming programs on our website, where you can also sign up to receive our weekly newsletter. On behalf of the Global International House community and One Shared World, I want to welcome you again and thank you for joining us today. And now I'd like to invite Betsy Begso, Program Director for Davis Projects for Peace, to begin our program. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you all on this special occasion to celebrate the International Day of Peace with International Houses Worldwide. I'm Betsy Vakeso. I'm the director for, Proje uh, for Projects for Peace. Projects for Peace is located at Middlebury College, but I'm calling to you today uh, from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'll be moderating the panel today. The theme of creating a culture of peace seems particularly fitting, fitting given that we are also celebrating the centenary of International House New York this year. Congratulations to International House New York on its extraordinary history of fostering intercultural understanding. And today, a special shout out to International Houses in New York, London, Chicago, and Berkeley, who nominated the grantees that are on our panel today. Thank you, everybody, for giving me a, 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 an opportunity to join you today. It's an honor to be part of the gathering. Projects for Peace was founded in 2007 by Catherine Wasserman Davis, a name no doubt familiar to you. Mrs. Davis celebrated her 100th birthday by funding 100 projects proposed by student leaders from about 100 educational institutions. The program was so successful, uh, Mrs. Davis and, and later her family continued to support more than 125 projects each year. Originally administered by the Davis United World College Scholars Program, the program is now housed at the Center for Community Engagement at Middlebury College in Vermont. Through the years, Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Davis's words are still at the heart of this program. Quote, the challenge is to bring about a mindset of preparing for peace instead of preparing for war. 
Consider for a moment the magnitude of this challenge. She was asking us to turn our attention and our talents to peace. For so many reasons, maintaining a focus on peace is, very, is a very hard thing to do. Yet Mrs. Davis had faith and trust that young people were up to the challenge. To this day, our proposal requires applicants to define peace for themselves and then to describe how they will work towards it. Since 2007, the program has partnered with about 115 different educational institutions and almost 2,500 projects have been completed in about 150 countries. As one of our partners, International House Worldwide has the unique responsibility of nominating up to 20 projects a year, a suitable recognition, I think, of the remarkable mission and history of the International Houses. The four individuals who will be sharing their experiences today are all members of the 2024 cohort of grantees from International House, and so are fresh from their experiences of preparing for peace. I'd like to begin with introductions and then we'll proceed with a conversation. We'll start with definitions of peace and then move to project descriptions so everybody can hear about what, how they spent their summer or uh, the last few months. Um, then we'll talk about what, what it was like to prepare for the project, what implementation was like, and what's happened these last few weeks as they've closed their project and, and are thinking about the future. Um, I'd invite everybody to put um, com questions in the chat um, if, if you've got questions for any one of us, um, because we should have time at the end to respond to a few audience uh, questions. I'll begin with inter introductions now. Animish Singh Basnat is an artificial intelligence research fellow at the Cybersecurity Research Center of London Metropolitan University where he specializes in creating data-driven decisions for businesses in Nepal. He is also a core member, a core team member of Digital Kala, an initiative aimed at addressing gender disparities through digital literacy and is an active volunteer at Code for Nepal. Animish received his master's and bachelor's in science from London Metropolitan University. Welcome, Animish. Thank you for having me. Barak Tan, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he focuses on democratic theory and authoritarianism. His research explores how author authoritarian governments appeal to citizens and shore up popular support through the case of contemporary Turkey. Barack holds an MA in social sciences from the University of Chicago's Masters of Arts in Social Sciences program and has dual BAs in political science and sociology from Buyazachi University in Turkey. Excuse me. Welcome, Barak. Hi, Betsy. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Excellence Anarika Joshua. Excellence is currently finishing a master's in development engineering in the healthcare transformations track at the University of California at up Berkeley. She is a MasterCard Foundation Scholar and Impact Entrepreneur from Nigeria, balancing dual passions for social entrepreneurship and healthcare innovation. She is dedicated to creating scalable solutions that not only empower African women in technology, but also address systemic issues in healthcare. Welcome, Excellence. Thanks, Betsy. And finally, we have Huang Dang. Huang Dang is the founder and chief executive officer of Hope Box social enterprise, which provides employment, training, and support to women affected by gender-based violence. She is also the executive director of the Australia-Vietnam Leadership Dialogue. Huang graduated from Swinburne University of Technology and earned a Master of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, in 2023, Huang was selected as one of 12 Obama Foundation Scholars and spent one year at Columbia University in New York. Welcome, Huang. Thank you. Okay, let's begin with definitions of peace, since that is at the heart of this work. Animesh, we'll start with you, then move to Barack, Excellence, and then Huang. Sure. Um, Amish, how do you define peace? Um, peace for me is the sustainable growth and support of marginalized communities through educational empowerment and the promotion of diversity. My definition of peace goes beyond the absence of conflict that we're all familiar with. It's about keeping, it's about breaking down systematic barriers and enabling equity, where every individual, regardless of their background, 
has the chance to reach their full potential. Peace is not passive. It's on. It's an ongoing effort to uplift, empower, and celebrate the unique contributions of all members of the society. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Barack, what would you like to say? Um, so I define peace as an openness for uh, navigating arising disagreements on collective life. Um, so what I mean by that is um, I take peace as a social condition in which people can uh, publicly raise their concerns over the various relationships of um, inequality and violence they experience, whatever they might be, and then find the opportunity to build communities so that they can collectively um, demand change. Um, so, you know, peace, uh, as the way I understand it, as Animesh actually said, it's not exactly a static condition of just like lack of conflicts. Um, it's not something that can be reached and preserved uh, once and for all so that we can be finally, you know, resting. Um, but it's also not a horizon that communities must constantly work to so be attained. Um, so I believe understanding peace in either of those ways, like either too static or always in the future, almost like risks understanding, uh, sorry, risks uh, reproducing um, the conditions of oppression that these communities go through. I, I, I love that you've brought in that dynamic of change over uh, and being sensitive to how the standards of peace can change over time. Mm -hmm. right? um, excellence, what's your definition of peace? Um, to me, peace is a state of balance and alignment. It's um, an environment where individuals can pursue education and economic activities without fear of disruption due to violence or anything else. But for me, I'm actually talking more about safety, about opportunity, and about hope. It's um, when I was approaching the projects of peace, for me, I was relating peace um, as an avenue in my hometown where everyone, but most especially young people, can flourish uninterrupted um, and have access to opportunities, but not just providing that environment for them, but enabling them not to be the disruptors, the disruptors of um, peace in the society. So for me, for me, peace is being able to access and live without disruption and being able to do whatever you want to do without disruption and actually not being a disruptor as well. Thank you very much, Excellence. Huang, tell us about how you see peace. Thank you. Um, similarly to, I'm um, very aligned with everyone um, for the definition of peace and aligning with my work. Um, my definition of peace is freedom and safety, especially with um, the work that I'm doing with Hope Ups, where we provide a safe place for women and children to who escape from gender-based violence. So for me, I think uh, simply sa safety means everyone deserves to be living in a safe in a safe house in their own home, in their own families and communities, the schools and, and uh, workplace where they don't have the fear of, of violence, um, where they, you know, they be, they're being treated uh, equally and um, empowered to, to do whatever they want to do and to make decisions um, regardless of their status, of their background, um, ethnic minorities living in Vietnam where we have 54 um, ethnic minorities. So everyone should have especially um, women and, and children from um, marginalized community. Um, so safety and freedoms are two things that is very important um, to our core values of work every day. Thank you, Huang. Why don't we stay with you and tell us, um, tell us what your project was. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so my project is about educating um, Vietnamese community to end gender-based violence, um, where I uh, spent the last summer to work with our um, our documentary producer to produce um, two documentary about um, raising awareness about gender-based violence. So the work that we have been doing, providing more of the um, work placements, um, job and vocational training for women who are victims of domestic violence. And then I learned that in order to tackle these very big issues, we have to go into preventative educational program. 
So with the project, we invested the money into producing video, we put into uh, communication, social media, so that we can send the message out there. And then the second part of the project is um, produce, uh, building a curriculum called Art for Hope uh, to approach it in a way that is more exciting and uplifting. So I partner with a uh, uh, actually, uh, a scholar from um, uh, University of Chicago to be an art um, for her program that we will be implementing in the high school in Vietnam. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to move to Barack and then we'll uh, talk with Excellence and then Anamish. Barack, tell us about your project. Um, so the title of my project was uh, Community Networks Against Gender Discrimination in Southeast Turkey. Uh, we aim to elevate the discrimination faced by especially LGBT plus individuals uh, in the Kurdish cities in Turkey by forming a self-sustaining political community. Uh, so with this end in mind, um, I worked with a local NGO called BAKAD uh, or Cultural Studies for Peace Association uh, and established a community center in Diyarbakir which is the largest uh, Kurdish city in uh, the southeastern regions of the Turkish Republic. So the center had uh, and still has three main parts, uh, a library that focuses on peace studies, uh, feminist literature and Kurdish history, where we also collected archival material on the queer movement in the region. And we built this part particularly because the libraries in the region and even the universities in the region were lacking in this kind of literature. Um, we established a movie screening area within here uh, where both the NGO or any, honestly, any interested individual or group can organize uh, screenings and try to build community around these. And a meeting hall for semi-public uh, talks, workshops, where together with the library, of course, individuals can benefit from as a physical space to come together, uh, work, study, uh, or just socialize. Um, and lastly, and perhaps honestly, most importantly, we founded an LGBT plus uh, support hotline with Bakat, the only one of its kind in this entire region that operates through uh, volunteers uh, who receive uh, professional training and provide legal and psychological assistance to the people. So on the one hand, we try to actually elevate the actual um, living conditions of LGBT people, Kurdish LGBT people in this area, while on the other hand, we try to provide some kind of infrastructure so that they can come together and create this like self-sustaining uh, political community in Diyarbakir. Thank you very much. Um, Excellence, would you like to share your project with us? Thank you very much, Bertie. So my project was based on the pervasive insecurity in the eastern part of Nigeria. Um, for a couple of years now, we've had a pervasive insecurity, which is due to insurgencies, including what we call the unknown gunmen, killing people and agitations and all of that. And this insecurity and instability has significantly impacted the youth um, in terms of disrupting education and also economic activities and community life. There are days where people are mandated not to actually come out in the southeastern part of Nigeria. And the challenge is most young males are particularly susceptible to this, and they're actually drawn into the conflict. Like I said, they're called the unknown gunmen because people are not able to name them. But most young men are actually joining them, saying that there are no other options. It has also excavated because of the rate of unemployment in the country as well. So my project, which was building peace through digital empowerment in a number of states, um, was the proposal which I submitted and which I worked on was to conduct digital skills training for young men in the state and then connect them to opportunities. The idea was if there was an alternative, um, yes, they were locked in at home. They didn't have so many options to access opportunities and work and education, but they could learn online. And if they're able to learn relevant digital skills and able to access work opportunities globally, they would have an option against the violence or joining to cause this to continue the circle of violence and instability in the state. So we saw digital education as a tool for peace. So what I did with my team, um, we had collaborations with the government and some members of my team where we created digital lessons and taught them over a couple of weeks virtually. Um, 
digital skills that they could learn within three months and actually begin to make money from the comfort of their homes with their phones or their laptops. So we taught them those skills. Um, but beyond teaching them the digital skills, we also had what we call life enhancement calls, where they had to understand their part or what their role was in creating peace and why the whole idea and the perpetuation of violence was really against them and their future. So we con continually communicated that to them and they were divided into small groups where they had mentors, understanding what their civic responsibility was, understanding leadership, understanding how to bridge peace and how to create peace and also worked on projects. Then after that, those who were successful and passed the test were able to connect them with the com community for them to begin to access jobs um, remotely. So that was what my project was about. Thank you, Excellence. And Animesh, please tell us about your project. Sure. Before I start, I'm really happy to see how some similar our projects are when it comes to tackling issues with gender and marginalized communities of our home country. Talking about my project, I'd like to start with a fact about Nepal. In Nepal, only 35% of those employed in the IT sector are women, and a mere 0.6% of females pursue IT courses after finishing high school. I experienced this, this disparity firsthand in my own team, which consisted of only one woman compared to 10 men. Despite our efforts to hire more women, these startling statistics underscore a significant gender gap in the rapidly evolving sector of IT. And it was the gap that my project Digital Kala aimed to close. This project was centered in Lalitpur, Nepal, focusing on closing the gender gap in the IT sector by empowering young women from underprivileged backgrounds with digital literacy skills. This involved collaboration with local institutions like Asman and Maywad School, targeting students in grades 10 to 12 at a pivotal moment as they considered future studies in their respective fields. The project aimed to provide hands-on training in programming and data analytics, utilizing resources from Code for Nepal and the Data Camp platform to enhance their learning experience. The idea was to conduct intensive three-week workshops teaching computer basics, Python programming, data science, and Microsoft Excel, accumulating in a workshop to prepare these young women for tech-related careers. And lastly, this issue became important to me after participating in a similar program focused on digital footprint and security. My team and I traveled to rural areas in Nepal, where I saw firsthand the transformative power of education in bridging the digital divide. This experience fueled my commitment to using my education and resources to make a tangible difference in the lives of marginalized communities, particularly young women in my home country. Terrific, thank you very much. I'd like to go um, uh, back to Barack. Uh, please, if you could describe what your thought process was when you were developing your proposal. Um, so thinking back those many months um, when you were just getting started and you and you were maybe had an idea about what about submitting an, um, a project uh, proposal for Projects for Peace. What were you thinking about? What was your thought process in developing the proposal? Um, Brock, and then we'll we'll go to Anamish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, so when I saw the call from uh, the International House, my mind uh, obviously immediately went to the uh, Turkish history of civil war in the Kurdish uh, areas. I'm from Turkey. I lived there almost all my life. Um, so when I thought like, oh, there is actually an opportunity to design a project about peace, uh, the first thought was like it should be something in the southeastern regions of Turkey uh, that can perhaps uh, both elevate the physical living conditions there and create something a bit sustainable. Um, and that was literally uh, the second thing that came up to my mind. Whatever I think uh, can be designed, uh, it should not just end after, you know, the multiple, uh, like, I guess, at most three months of the summertime, like after I am done with my project and return to Chicago, whatever I created hopefully should actually stand there uh, in a, at least in a marginally self-sustaining way. Uh, so based on these, I uh, started contacting the people I knew from my fieldwork, uh, both in uh, Southeast regions and in Istanbul. I contacted uh, people whether, um, you know, about like whether they knew some NGOs who might be interested in devising a project like this. And I tried to learn about uh, what was needed, what the scope of this project might actually be used for if our um, project was approved 
by the Davis Group. And we were incredibly uh, lucky to work, obviously, with uh, the iHouse mentors I have in Chicago. So between the NGO in Turkey, my academic work, and the guidance we received, the end result was this community center and hotline. It sounds like you had a multi-pronged approach. And I'm curious, did you did you know all those, did you, did, did you know you were going to be working with all those different approaches at the beginning, or did those emerge over the course of the project? Uh, definitely the latter. I knew that uh, even at the beginning, I knew that uh, even though I have some regional expertise, I wanted to work with an NGO uh, that was in the area. Like I wanted this to be a grassroots project, um, mostly because I do not know what can be achieved with the amount of funding you will receive, what would be the most beneficial way to move forward. So I wanted to actually draw from their expertise. But of course, on the other side, uh, the people at the international houses have basically decades of experience doing these projects, and they know what works. They know what in the past worked. So after our first initial draft that we basically co-wrote with the NGO people, um, our collaborators at the iHouse Chicago were the ones who you know, gave us a lot of very useful uh, strategies and pointers on how that this could actually become something manageable in three months. Managing the time and managing the budget become a really concrete set of tasks when you're looking at all those complicated logistics. Yeah. Um, and Amish, um, perhaps you could tell us about what was your thought process in developing your proposal? Sure. Um, the th my thought process were more, was more personal. So when I began developing the proposal for this project, I was inspired by a conversation with my mom. She was actually reading a book when we discussed her educational journey, including how we both graduated from high school at almost the same time. I know it sounds crazy, but um, this conversation that I had with my mom reminded me of the deeper educational disparities in our society, especially in Nepal, and motivated me to address what I saw as a fundamental issue I could take, I could make an impact in. With this inspiration, I reflected on my own skills that I was um, working as a data analytics and studying AI. And as a self-learner who's very passionate about doing online courses, I knew I could craft a content that could cater to the I, uh, to anyone that is in, um, that is wanting to make a start start a career in IT. And um, I could use all these skills. Um, to make this happen. But not only this, I could also make the content in a way that would meet the specific needs of these young women um, that are kind of like new to technology and making sure they're trained in an impactful and, and accessible way. While developing this proposal itself, I partnered with a friend, Tabi Kalmacharya, uh, who shared my vision. And together, we kind of expanded our efforts from an individual initiative to a collaborative team effort. We engaged with local institutions, uh, utilizing our collective networks to align our project with the community needs. And we specially planned the logistics, ensuring that all of our workshops that we're scheduling during um, this time would be during the school holidays to accommodate the students' availability. Thereby, uh, we kind of enhanced their participation and um, this planning kind of helped us create a program that is both practical and transformative for all of the participants that were involved. I love that you that there's that strong personal connection, but also that you knew what skills and expertise you had to offer, right? That that you had expertise in in AI, and you thought, how can I use this to to uh, contribute uh, to, or or to help mitigate gender disparities that you were seeing in education. Great. Um, let's um, continue with Excellence and Huang. Um, and I want to hear about how you developed your projects. And I'm curious about how did you, how did your academic work contribute to your project design, if at all? Um, maybe we'll start with Excellence. Okay. Um, for me, I personally experienced the transformative power of digital skills. And I just knew that I wanted to in the same lifeline. So prior to coming to Berkeley, I run a social enterprise that has trained young women across the countries in Africa on digital. Over 30% of them to job opportunities. 
Uh, Excellence, so I'm, gonna inter I'm gonna interrupt you just for a minute. I, the connection is not great. So um, at least for me, the speech is a little garb garbled. I'm wondering if you can turn off your camera and we can try. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Ed. Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was rather surprised. Oh, excellent. The, con the connection is, is really difficult. I'm going to move on to Huang, um, and hopefully we can get you, get you back online. Huang, tell us about how, what your thought process was when you were developing your proposal, what you were thinking about, and how did your academic studies contribute to your project? So, um, so my first step, I talked with my, my team back home in Vietnam um, to make sure that what I'm doing is aligned with our plan for this year, our strategy, our core mission. Um, so to make sure that we are on the same page and we have the capacity uh, to do it as well uh, and everyone making everyone on top of, of what is happening. Um, so that's the first step. And then the second step, I talk with my friends who is doing the documentary uh, to see this is my vision. Um, this is the community that I want to support. Uh, what do you think? And do you have any comments? So I involve those two audience in uh, and then um, I wanted to make sure that the, pro uh, the, the project is, uh, has its sustainability. It's not a one-off project. Uh, it should be a long-term one. And then I would see the opportunity is how this project can be pitched to other funders to continue to carry it on. Um, so it's a lot of things involved in it. Uh, with, this, um, with this small funding, uh, with this grant, how can I um, make use of every dollars? Um, so um, then I talked to the scholar in, in UC, uh, UC Chicago to see the possibilities of partnering as well. Um, and then with the, um, with the academic involvement, uh, I was very lucky because I, I did a year at um, Columbia University. And so last year I uh, took a class called The Art of uh, Storytelling for Social Impact Campaign. So it helped me so much about using digital and storytelling to really cultivate uh, the project and the ideas and, and develop from there. So it's been a really good um, uh, learning journey as well. And storytelling is a big part of, of sharing the story and telling the story in a more um, in a more uplifting way, because talking about gender-based violence is, is a very heavy topic. So finding different angles and talking, I talk a lot with my professor as well to see, you know, uh, can you help me um, to fame it a bit, to see uh, what is the possibility of using different kind of um, storytelling skills to be able to talk about this? Um, so, and, and who are our audience? Um, um, and who, who are our participants, like not just only, not just only um, the women, but also children and their supporters as well. And I talked with one of the um, guest speakers during the, during the program with the Obama Foundation Scholar Program. And she would advise me, like talk about, you know, getting the men involved and um, talking in, in an angle where um, the father can talk about their involvement and what they hope for for women to be able to, you know, to to um, prevent gender-based violence. So I think there were so much that I explored that I didn't thought of it before. Um, so by really having a lot of conversation with different people, that gives me a bigger ideas of what I really want to do. That's a great example of a connection between a course that you that you were able to take and directly apply that knowledge here. To your uh, to your project, thank you, um, Excellence. Um, can we check with you? How hope your connection is improving? We're we're interested in hearing about you your. We can, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, How, okay. What was your thought process with, you. your, with writing your proposal? Okay, so I said prior to coming to Berkeley, I run a social enterprise back in Nigeria where I had trained over 10,000 young women from across Africa on digital skills, and we were training them and connecting them to job opportunities. So we had connected over 35% at that time. However, most people kept requesting, um, how about the men? How about the boys? You're training the boys. What are the boys? Um, but it wasn't quite significant until I came here and I began to hear about peace and what 
peace words and the projects of peace for peace. Now, I'm from the southeastern part of Nigeria, so I knew what this insurgency was and how it was men were being affected and all of that. And so I decided, okay, um, we can do this for the boys. We can implement what we have done for the girls that worked, but for the boys now in this case, because that was going to help us enhance peace. So as a student of development engineering here, we had learned how to not just dump down solution, but understand what beneficiary center design was, how to ensure that our beneficiaries were at the center of our solution giving people what they really want not what you think they want um i'd learned that from school i'd also learned how to give sustainable projects and to think about the long-lasting impacts of whatever projects you were doing and so all this knowledge i'd learned from my program at development engineering i impacted i implemented it in designing and working on evaluating our project to see yes we had done this for the girls but how do we modify this for the boys so one thing we first did i first did was collaborate with um a non-profit that was on ground there currently to tell me what was going on and look at the design, the curriculum to see what was working and what was actually feasible, cut in here and there. And those things helped us even in the um, implementation and the development and the execution of um, the whole project. So everything I learned from development engineering was very relevant to our project to roll. Thank you very much. It sounds like all of you did intensive community engagement. I'm really happy to hear about that, both in terms of in your planning process, but then also moving into implementation. Of course, you were partnering with partnering with um, organizations on the ground. Um, we have a question from the audience, which is um, uh, about the metrics that you use to measure the impact of the project. So did you plan ahead of time about how would you measure success? And then I'm curious about towards the end of the project, were you using the same measuring tools? Would anybody like to respond to that? Shall I? Yes, I can. Okay, go ahead. Um, so when we developed the proposal, we had short-term goals and long-term goals um, for our impact analysis where for, our short, for the short term, we're trying to look at those who were going to complete the program actually. And we had assessments that they were going to take. So the assessment was going to help us know those who had gained the digital skills. And then within the time, frame of the program, how many people are able to get jobs that could pay them before the end of the program. So those are things we wanted to see. And because of, of the projects that they had to do, another um, goal or KPI we're looking at was how we're, how they were able to strengthen the community relationships during the program. Then on the long term, we're looking at sustainable employment for participants. So not just getting that first job, but over time, how were they able to continue to get jobs and how we're able to replicate the program model in other conflict prone areas. And so that's why it was very important for us to actually work with those in the community and working with the um, Anambra Hub who are there and will continue to be there was very significant to um, the whole project from start um, to finish. So that was what we used for our KPIs and we're able to get data, hard data from that. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to respond to that question about what were you thinking about in terms of success and what it would look like? Uh, I think I'll so perhaps jump in. Um, so we were actually quite lucky that um, the software uh, we want to use for the hotline actually already collected the data of who called, who actually uh, stayed on the line for how many minutes. And then basically within the training we provided to our volunteers, we asked them to collect some, I mean, obviously this is an anonymous hotline, but we still collect some rudimentary data on where these people are coming from, uh, their gender, uh, what were the specific issues they were contacting us about, and whether we were able to help them in any meaningful way. So we started collecting this data, and as we started to collect data, as we saw that people were um, basically calling us on specific topics rather than others that we expected, uh, we tried to gear our approach towards these areas. So we, for example, changed our um, social media presence uh, to actually provide information to the public on these topics. Uh, it was quite uh, helpful. The other part, um, the community building enterprise, it's obviously about who actually comes to the community center, who are the return uh, members who come to the meetings, to the workshops, et cetera. Um, and that's, a, I would say, less tangible approach to collecting the data. 
Um, but it's also very nice to actually see that people are interested in the project and in the community center uh, to the extent that we uh, found a chance to collect a second round of uh, volunteers, had a second round of training since I left the field and returned to Chicago and saw that the project actually sustains itself. Terrific. Great examples. Thanks. Thanks to you both. I want to switch to implementation. So so at some point you you knew you were in the midst of the project. You had stopped planning and you had started started the actual work. I want to hear about um, certainly community engagement. We have a question from the audience about um, how did being in international spaces and communities affect the way you came up with your project design and how you implemented it. Um, and I'm curious whether there's memorable moments for you, turning points that you had, um, and curious about whether everything went as planned. Um, uh, Huang, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great place to be in an international space that I can learn so much um, because the context of, of Western world and the developing world like Vietnam, it's just so different. So whatever we learn from the international uh, context, it needs to be practical in, in, in our home country. It needs to be relevant to our audience as well and participants. So what I did, um, I love conversations. So I, 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 when I meet people, I would ask them what they are doing, what they are thinking about this topic. So by that, I learned so much about what they are doing. So then I would talk to them about it, like how about a collaborative uh, project that we can do, but we can tweak a bit to, uh, to make it more uh, practical. Uh, and to make it more relevant to our our local community, um, so I would talk with people at I House. I would talk with the scholars that I'm involved with um, uh, to really frame uh, the ideas and to know that oh, this is this is very cool. What you are doing very is very cool, and I want to bring the program to Vietnam. Uh, I may not have the skills in in producing curriculum or building curriculum, but I know who I can get uh, support and who I can partner, who I can get as a consultant. And then I would talk to uh, a, con a communication consultant who uh, was um, doing it with the the Obama Foundation's uh, program, who delivered a session to us. So I would. Uh, set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her saying, I have this project, can you help me to see how can I communicate with our, our audience in Vietnam and how can I build that kind of plan? Uh, so it's really important that, um, that we need to utilize all the networks that we have and learning by, um, by also see if this is possible to implement um, and who is doing it in, in the community. Is there an existing program uh, locally, or is there something else that we can bring it to our community? Uh, so I learned a lot about about that. Um, what is the second part of the questions? Was there anything mem memorable in the midst of it, implementing it? Did you face any challenges or have to change direction in the um, middle, middle oh, of anything? Yeah, so although I learned so much, I, I think the biggest um, part was uh, when we producing the documentary, um, it was so hard to get the participant to talk about their experience. Um, we want to film the women who have already experienced it so that we know um, this is a real story, but it was so triggering, so it required a lot. Um, and then I have to talk to someone from Australia who has already doing that kind of work um, to have a framework for our producer in Vietnam to interview the, the, the participants. Uh, so there were additional works that add on. Uh, at some point I got really stuck. I was, and I was so worried. I was like, I have only uh, another month to really work on this and I can't afford to delay it. Um, but it's really challenged me about um, thinking outside of the box and getting help. And there are people there who are really willing to support. Um, and the most memorable uh, moment is that I am always so curious about what is out there that people are doing. Um, and I love being innovative and creative. Um, so I would spend, you know, like 4 a.m. talking with my <laughs> friend from, from, you know, from the other side of the world, basically. So it, it was really amazing how to see um, digital and, you know, internet can help us really connecting us um, to do something that is, that seems so far, like from my friend who always wanted to bring the program internationally and she has never done it before. So we were so excited about uh, about connecting each other and, and 
to, to make this program uh, more global when we build the Art for Hope program. Yeah. Thank you so much. Those are vivid example of how, of, of, of how you had to work on a daily basis uh, yeah. to make to realize your project. And Amish, can you talk a little bit about the implementation of your project? What maybe things that didn't go as planned or um, memorable moments of success? Uh, sure. So before I start, I think I, I would like to break down the implementation to three stages, where one is the conceptualization, the second one is development, and finally, the actual practical implementation itself. When I talk about conceptualization, I think it was quite easy for me because like I knew what skills I had, what I wanted to do. So creating the proposal and like um, having an idea on what I really wanted to was quite easy. But when it comes to the development, which is for me is the um, content or the presentation that I was gonna show, I think it was a bit tough uh, despite being a member of Code for Nepal where I had a lot of access to the uh, relevant courses in data analytics and AI. Like I, I generally had a lot of presentations. I um, somehow was, uh, because I was talking with people about Davy Space Project, some of my professors and uni and then a few staff at London Met actually gave assistance to me to kind of work on my content and actually make it more relevant and more easy for a layman to to be engaged in and have fun while doing this. And now talking about the implementation itself, um, for me, when I began this project from mid of June to the uh, first week of July, um, which covered around three weeks of hands-on workshops, um, I broke it down into three different weeks where the first week I was doing more hands-on basics and uh, making sure everyone was kind of like communicating with each other because there were a lot of participants within the workshop, it was very important for me to make sure there is an environment where every student is able to communicate properly and do not feel shy, even with us, because uh, for them, it's it's a short time, but for us, it's more about creating a connection with them, right? So we covered a bit of fun, uh, fundamentals of hardware, software, and internet safety. And we made sure that the foundation was solid for everyone involved, right? In the second week, we kind of do more into Python programming this is where you get your hands dirty, you learn a bit of coding. And honestly, the participants learn everything from uh, basic syntax to loops to complex data structures, and they were having fun. It was really fun. And then finally, um, in the third week, we delved a bit into data analytics. Um, here, they used both Excel and Pandas in Python to kind of manipulate and create visualizations and learn a bit more about like um, data sets and how do you express numbers into words or pictures. Um, and then um, talking about how, how the whole project went in general, I think for me, nothing went as planned. Um, from the school not having basic internet connection to the summer heat and suffocating weather in Nepal, it felt like everything was against me. Um, we also had to change the content almost every day because we realized that the students were sometimes taking a longer time to understand a certain topic. Uh, and it also, the, the topic itself being a bit too more too complex for someone who's like starting out. So we had to change it almost every day. And to add to that, I also had travel restrictions for only two weeks, which means that I had to leave the first week in the hands of my team at Rapal before I could actually go there and take the sessions myself. And um, the only thing that helped this during this process uh, is that we started this project really early at March. We started the development process itself. We started talking with the school that I was uh, involved with and then making sure all of these logistics would be taken care of uh, with the amount that Davis Peace Project provided. It was actually uh, easy for me to hire some volunteers and someone in logistics to handle issues with the venue and also ask my friend Labi Kramacharya to view the school in person while I was away in UK. Um, we also set deadlines, which is very important for anyone who's um, gonna apply later on 
to make sure that you prepare yourself for any hiccups along the way and um, also define any responsibilities within yourself and the team if you have one. And then more importantly, every day during these three weeks, we had a meeting after our project where we talk about what went well and what we could improve on. And this was a really good way of like understanding our own shortcomings and like kind of improving on it. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk about a really memorable moment is that when I saw students actually come early to class, like even an hour early to like learn a bit more into programming, practice by themselves and uh, talk with us to learn more about like what um, programming and um, a field, a career in data analytics would look like. And the fun fact being um, one of the students actually got a scholarship during this time to pursue her um, career in IT. I mean, sorry, higher studies in IT. And uh, finally, I'd like to really thank for the, the Daily Peace um, project for the budget that it, it really helped in every aspect from buying a proper projector to, sh to show the presentation in the venue where there were no proper curtains and to even put internet connection in the venue itself. So without the, this generation, generous amount, from Davy's team, it really wouldn't have been uh, possible to conduct this project with the level of detail and freedom that we had during. Thank Davey's you so team. much, Anamish. Um, um, I am really struck by how detailed your planning was, and yet there were so many things that needed to be adjusted on the day or as you went, um, and that um, even having, you knew you had the funding available, but you also knew it was the um, daily conversations that were essential to move the project forward. Um, and we heard that from Huang as well in terms of the, how critical that was in the course of implementation. We're getting close to, to, to the end of our time. Um, I want to um, uh, invite Barack and Excellence to speak about um, uh, any aspect of impl implementation. Um, one question that's come up uh, from the audience is how you managed other, other responsibilities. What was going on at university? Did you have a job? Did you have other family responsibilities? Were you able, or were you able to take time off and focus on this project full time? Um, Barack or Excellence, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, obviously there were unexpected things. Uh, at side of the implementation, you'll have an idea when you go to the field and it never works as planned, right? Um, so basically, I think it was a week before uh, I reached the Arbucker. Um, I heard that there were, well, we all saw that there were some attacks, like public attacks, on people who were dancing on the streets. So it was actually quite unexpected. We did not really, un nobody understood what was exactly happening. Uh, in the next uh, weeks in the next months, we basically understood that the broader geopolitical condition in the Middle East, uh, with the conflict between like Israel and Palestine, actually started to impact southern Turkey as well. So we saw that the conservative movement was getting uh, stronger. I think about a week after I arrived there, uh, there were some uh, thugs that attacked what they saw as American supported uh, restaurants and cafes, and then there were some bombings afterwards to the more you know, left-leaning areas. So obviously all of these things made us change uh, how publicly visible we could be. So originally we thought our community center would be open to the public. Originally we thought some of our volunteers would actually go out on the streets. Uh, we had these like quite large, um, almost two feet to one feet posters that we were going to uh, you know, put around none of that could actually happen. We had to, you know, create a Google form, actually uh, make sure that every person who wants to come to the community center were the people who they claim to be, and it wouldn't uh, jeopardize the safety of either uh, the volunteers or the other people who wanted to use the community center. Um, towards the, uh, about the second question, uh, so I'm not going to lie, obviously this is a quite labor intensive process. You need to go to a different country, different city. You need, uh, this takes out of your attention, out of your time. Um, luckily for me, part of my academic work was also uh, on this region. Uh, parts of my dissertation is about civil wars and how authoritarian leaders uh, justify increasing the dosage of violence in civil wars. 
Um, so while I was there, I found the opportunity to do some interviews about my academic work as well with other NGO workers, other individuals. Um, but honestly, I would say about 70% of my time was completely um, you know, taken up by this project. Not only the day-to-day -day implementation, but thinking about uh, the future of the project, applying to other grants, uh, thinking about how things might actually be structuralized after I leave the field sites. Uh, all these things take time. Thank you very much. Excellence, tell us about implementing your project. Well, for me, um, balancing all was more of structure for me. Uh, like I said, I run a social enterprise back in Nigeria. So I had I already had a team who were hands-on and very supportive. Then we had the, the, the organization we're partnering with, they were very supportive. And we also had a buy-in from the government. Um, they supported us as well, um, giving us the venue and also personnel to work with us. So it kind of made a lot of things easier for me. Um, yeah, so that was how I was able to balance it. And it was also over the summer. Um, I was working, but I was working remotely and the time difference. So I could work here and then they were ahead of time. And so I could work there. And most part of the learning was um, virtual. So we met once a week, but we had the courses on the learning management system. So they were able to take the courses at their pace, take the assessment. Then once a week, we were able to review. So that was how I was able to win at it all over that time. I just was able to put structure where where it had to. So I think it's very important to understand your time. And like Animesh said, we also started early. Like I said, the project was more like a replication of what we had done for the girls, but we're modifying it. So we took what was relevant and it was easier to implement. And we started very early. Once we knew we were selected, we started working on these partnerships and reviewing and building all of this even before the summer. Thank you. We have a question from the audience um, that Barack addressed to some extent, but I, I wondered if anybody else wanted to check in on this. Did you ever face challenges or different opinions about your research topic, your research topic or your project topic? Um, and if so, how did you address them? Did you run in, Huang, you talked about how um, some of the women were reluctant to speak on camera, right? So that's a kind of, oh. kind of, you know. So I think that that is the uh, that is the biggest challenge I faced um, because, especially in Vietnam, like any other topic you can talk about, uh, you know, you're from a poor background, you talk about different kind of disadvantage, but gender-based violence or especially family violence is still something very private. It's still something very family. They still consider like this is a family thing. I don't want to uncover what is so ugly about my family. Um, that's number one. Number two is that defining gender-based violence is still something very um, confusing. So for a lot of women, uh, violence means they need to be, you know, physically beaten, but controlling or finance or making decisions or um, mentally uh, abuse, they, it, it took time to really help them to understand that, to talk about it and how being financially independent can help them avoid it and and um, reduce or like um, remove themselves from gender-based violence. So a lot of social norms, stigmas. Um, so instead of me talking a lot with them, I need someone who can really have the skills as well. Like I do have my skill, but my skill is in business skill. I work with a lot of women, and but every woman's situation is very different. Um, so I connect them with my... Uh, with my sister who was a victim of domestic violence for seven years and she was the reason why I opened my social enterprise. So I connect them to, to so that they, are, they have a similar story and they are being empowered to talk about it um, from someone who already had that experience but get out of that and being now being independent and successful and see that this is a possibility and there is a future. Um, so my, I think my biggest challenge was what's about being able to really talk about it. Yeah, and, and um, but I think, I think after that, they, after that we, when we do the video, um, it's very successful because people would now think that, oh, I have never thought that uh, this situation is also violence, yeah. 
And Amish, I'm curious if you did you run into any challenges or different opinions about your about your approach? Uh, uh, sure, I think I've covered a lot of challenges, the challenges that I faced in person, and some of the challenges that were more regarding logistics. But I think another one challenge that I forgot to mention was that for some of the participants, um, they were the first to go to high schools or even like think about uh, higher studies. And for these girls who come with such background, who are like um, very financially restricted, um, for them to, to come to this project, it was a bit hard at first because um, there, there were limitations in terms of like, okay, if they come to this project, what is the final outcome? Like how can they actually go forward to actually have a career? So in that terms, it was really grateful for um, Code for Nepal to provide certain scholarships. And then for us to also um, use some funding to help them by giving them laptops to actually help them pursue their uh, career in IT. Because uh, for a lot of students, a major chunk of their um, money actually goes into equipments when it comes to IT. So. Uh, that's one of the challenges that I forgot to mention before. Thank you for that. Um, not everyone um, continues their specific project work. Um, uh, not, a, not every uh, project for peace grantee, but some do. It's neither an expectation nor a requirement that it continues, um, uh, but the impact of the project can live on in other ways. Um, so I'm curious, what do you feel might be the longer term impacts of your project for you and for the community that you worked with? Um, Excellence, would you like to begin? Well, for me, the issue we are addressing is an issue that is encountered by the whole of the southeastern states. And we have five eastern states. And I just worked in one state and just the community in that state. And so one of the outcomes we're looking at was the potential of replicating the project across other communities and other states of which we're already having conversations with. My organization is focused on girls and women. And so collaboration is very important and handy here. And so we are working with the Anambra Tech community to spread it across the state. We also spoke with the state government to see how can we include this into the secondary school curriculum um, to see how we could scale that. So we're having that kind of conversations and then also conversations with other states as well to see how we can, because for us, we're able to defend or argue the fact that digital literacy is now a life skill, just like um, numeracy and literacy and something they should all know. Um, and so, yes, we're working on that. We look forward to it being adopted and replicated across the Southeast and maybe across Nigeria as well. Remarkable. Thank you, Excellence. Animish, you didn't have a existing organization when you started. Um, do you see the work continuing in any way, or what's the long-term effect for you and and um, and the people you were working with? Um, you're, you're quite right. Actually, when we started off, although we were calling it a team like this at Kala, it hadn't started into an organization. And we actually had only like three members at the start, three to five members that we were like constantly changing because like someone had uh, their exams or something was going on. But because of this project, um, by the end of this uh, initiative, we actually started a group. We are yet to officially create an organization out of it, but we're uh, in the process of creating it actually. And then, um, talking about what we are going to go forward with this. Um, with the project, we saw clear impact on how we can Im uh, impact young kids, but now going to um, an even more uh, bigger problem, which is which in terms of Nepal is about, uh, yes, there are people with education, but what about job opportunities? So we're actually thinking of a model to kind of incul inculcate the people that we are giving um, courses to, to actually, um, perform industry um, level works or some kind of internship, which they can um, use to kind of boost their um, chances of going to the industry. Like, because um, right now, 
there's a lot of companies, uh, but there's actually less jobs when it comes to IED. So we want to create this model within ourselves, which will help these students start off their career in IT and eventually start off, start even their own companies, in fact. So that's the model that we're actually looking forward to. Barack, did you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, I mean, in my case, uh, honestly, it was easier because the NGO I was working with uh, was already there and they've been continuing their work since I returned. Uh, I continue to have at least weekly meetings with them. Uh, we uh, are in contact, especially when they need to apply to new grants, um, in, uh, stuff about their social media presence. Um, and yeah, we basically try to iron out any difficulty uh, whenever uh, they come up. It's so interesting because I didn't know these people three months ago. And now I feel so much solidarity with um, both the people who work at the NGO and the actual Kurdish LGBT people that I had a chance to meet and hopefully uh, help a little bit. So it's not that easy to, you know, like return to Chicago and leave everything behind. And I'm very happy to say that the work has been going on. Great to, great to hear. It's those relationships that were put in place, even if the even if the infrastructure isn't quite there, those relationships are in place um, that will carry you forward um, uh, with your vision. Can I come back? There was a question. There was a question about how you link your assessment me metrics to your definition of peace. So we're coming back now to, to, to your definition of peace. Now that you've done the project and you're thinking about um, in concrete terms what you accomplished, can you describe for us how those two things relate to you now after the project, how your work relates to peace building? Um, Barack, why don't we stay with you on that question? Uh, yeah, I mean, my definition of peace already uh, was quite integral to how I thought about the project. Um, for me, we cannot actually like strive for a specific benchmark where you know once we actually attain that, that's going to solve you know the issue that we are finally there. Um, we are talking about a region that's been going through a civil war uh, for a very long time, and there's some kind of conflict there since 1980s at least, and previously for you know the last couple centuries preceding that. Um, so what I hope to achieve was to create. So create this environment in which people could trust each other. They could come together as a community and make demands, either from, um, you know, like a, in a small scale, let's say, uh, come together, collect signatures and make a demand, or have a meeting with the local government, um, or have like some greater uh, demands, usually through social media or any kind of media presence. Um, so in terms of that, I would say the project has been beginning to be successful. But again, that's not something that um, you can achieve in a couple of months. That's something you can only contribute towards. I hope that uh, we achieved both through like ameliorating people's physical actual situation and by creating this physical space um, so that they can come together, get to know each other and start to trust each other. Uh, we started to build something that will end up in you know, the upcoming months or years uh, towards that end. Thank you, Barack. And Huang, can you, would you want to comment about that, about how you were able to put, put um, the videos in place and, and share them with the public? And then how do you see that connecting to that definition of peace that you held up at the beginning of this hour? Yeah, so um, for us, number one is um, is that we need to get the message out there for the younger generation of Vietnam. Like we target at, um, at students. Um, so with the video, we have very clear message about, you know, um, how can we create a safe place and how everyone is involving in. And gender-based violence is not a women issues, it's, it's everyone issues, it's our issues. So what is our role in cultivating, uh, you know, a space of safety nets and um, freedom for women? Um, so I think um, once we have a very clear message, we, we can easily assess and know that what we are working on this project aligned with our core missions. That is really important to, to us. And then with the project of, with the curriculum of the um, Art for Hope, uh, we built it in a very fun way and we target it to um, bring it to um, high school and university students. Um, and so because of that, 
we target, we are able to really um, reach to our our um, directly to our audience of who we are, who we want to raise awareness from, and who we want to educate um, in a fun way. Uh, so we know that at school, you guys, we can create a safe space um, for for other students as well. Um, so it's always very aligned with what we are doing, and we are very focusing on that. Um, I want to um, um, ask the, a question that was asked earlier to, uh, from the audience is, how did your iHouse experience impact your views on peace? Who would like to respond? Excellence, you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so it, at the iHouse here in Berkeley, we have this global leadership program, which I was partially a part of, partially because for a part I traveled for for most part for a bit. I was able to take the assessments and the test and it opened my eyes to a unique um, to a unique way to ad address or approach inclusivity and working with different cultures and different people. Yes, I was working with my people here, knowing that that's kind of my hometown, but they were just they were men, they were different. And so most of what I had done in that survey kind of helped me to um, know how to work with them and apply that also in their survey another thing that also helped me was um, understanding people and culture and trying to view that which was which came very handy in living in i house and i house was very important that you're living with people with different cultures and patience was important and trying to be inclusive so in our first week of the program we had built all of this and it was fantastic but then approaching it we encountered a, a problem and we had to review and it was things i had learned from that global leadership program that kind of helped me to know okay we are not perfect here let's go back let's listen to them and really understand what they are saying and why they are saying it and so i'm very grateful to have lived at the international house okay. Would somebody else like to comment about their experience at International House and how it impacted your views on peace? Um, I can add a bit more on that because last year and especially this year as well in Colombia, you know, there was a lot of protesting and um, and then I by watching all the uh, intervention uh, procedures and. Uh, the support that the the i house team has done for the students i just feel like it's um it's it's really helped me understand more about you know how to build a community of safety and how to be an agency to others as well um and also uh, at i house uh, new york we also had the meditation group um, where some other um some other residents also you know they just initiated it and then promoted it and then we joined it so there were a lot of activities for to help students especially in doing a very tough time and also during the finals and things like that so it makes me think like you know having a community of of people who support for when um when we encounter some kind of difficulties like being present being there for them is really important and it's that is is how we are cultivating a culture of peace for everyone not just something very big out there or global uh, out, you know global issues but it's something that is so relevant to us and so close to us that we can provide and lend a hand of support um that is so important during that that kind of time yeah thank you very much we just have two minutes left um if we if you would just like to share a little piece of advice that you'd give to anybody who's listening who's thinking about doing a project for peace so just a sentence each what advice do you have for someone who's considering to to apply uh animish um sure i think i think my advice might be a bit longer than a sentence <laughs> uh, so i think first of all you should identify a very clear and specific need which you can resonate um with because it all boils down to like what resonates with you what you feel really inspired to do and then um, really planning ahead, thinking about all the caveats that might come your way and then preparing, but also being open towards any challenges that you might face, face it with a smile, be more open. Excellent advice. 
any problems that might happen, right? Yeah. Thank you very much, Barack. Uh, I would say absolutely talk to the people already on the field, any grassroots organizations, any NGOs, because they know what they need and they know how you can actually help them the best. And also listen to your campus liaisons because they've been doing this for a long time. They will give you some great advice on how to get the award and how to implement it. Huang, thank you. Um, I think number one uh, advice is always to start with why. Why are you doing this? Um, and then you will know that. Um, then you have the answers. And also attend the information session <laughs> as a person who already had this, um, uh, who was already a, a recipient from last year, what is their challenge? So I think just cultivate that kind of conversation and really learn about that to give you that kind of understanding of what the challenge and what the opportunities is. Uh, it's really give a lot of um, thought about designing the projects. And also you have to be in it to win it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Excellence, you have the last word here about advice for potential applicants. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate what Juan said, that make sure you attend the information session. It is very important. And then also think with the end in mind. Start from the end and move forward, because whatever project you're doing, always think about sustainability, whether you're going to be there or not. But how are you going to perpetuate peace for them and for others? Thank you. So we're at the end of our time together. Um, I hope um, everybody who was listening enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I feel like I learned a great deal about, about the work that, um, the efforts that you were making, the work that you um, accomplished this summer and your ambitions for, for the future. So thank you to the panelists and to International House, the International Houses Worldwide for organi organizing this and bringing us together. Um, all the best to you. I look forward to hearing from next year's applicants uh, at Projects for Peace. All the best. Bye-bye.